it says setting up. I'm just letting, waiting for it to do its little thing. All right, Dan, you are live. Good afternoon and welcome to our innovative so setting up. I'm just waiting for it to oh, do its little thing. Okay, sorry about this. Good afternoon and welcome to Innovate, Learn, and Play, our third annual STEAM Expo for the Santa Fe Public Schools. My name is Dan Vieskis and I'm the Director of Digital Learning. Let us take a moment to have our planning committee introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Angie Walker and I'm the Santa Fe Public Schools STEM coordinator. Hi everyone, Christina Gonzalez. I'm the arts education coordinator for Santa Fe Public Schools. Hello, y bienvenidos. My name is Justine Chavez Crispin and I am the innovation coordinator for Santa Fe Public Schools. Thank you. It is always important for us to pause and acknowledge the land and community in which we serve. In our land acknowledgement, we are stating that I come to you this evening from the unceded lands or traditional territories of the Pueblo, Nidia, and Southern Ute peoples who have, uh, who have also long been home to the Diné. Santa Fe is also known as a plan for the Tiwa and Tano people and the Ogwa and Pogi, the white shell water place. We pay our respect to the Tiwa educators and all indigenous educators who continue to labor in public education, a system with a complicated history of ongoing colonization and suppression of our indigenous knowledge and the language we continue to wrestle with, acknowledging that our heritage of the culture and all of our students in our care. We also honor and celebrate our indigenous culture bearers and caretakers of the land, past, present, and future. We also encourage you to look up the, la the land that we are on here in Santa Fe, and it, the chat will show the link you can look that up at. The SFPS third annual STEAM Innovation Expo is a dynamic event, annual event, that showcases and inspires our SFPS community around the intersecting fields of science, technology, engineering, art, mathematics, and innovation. The Expo supports a computer science ready 2025 initiative by bringing together students, families, teachers, community, and community partners to envision the future of emerging interdependent ecosystem of STEAM fields in Santa Fe. We're gonna begin with tonight by introducing our board secretary, Sarah Bozin. Sarah? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at this wonderful STEAM Expo. Students, families, teachers, staff, and community members. I would first like to thank our community partners. They are also all listed on our website, the Audubon Southwest, Climate Advocates Voices Unidas, City of Santa Fe, Climate Reality Northern New Mexico, Keep Contemporary, Make Santa Fe, Meow Wolf, National Radio Astronomy Observatory, New Mexico Wildlife Center, River Source, Santa Fe Alliance for Science, Santa Fe Botanical Garden, Santa Fe Watershed Association, Site Santa Fe, Twirl, a place and discovery space, STEM Santa Fe, 350 Santa Fe, and many more. I am so excited about this particular topic. Um, you may or may not know, we are a STEAM family. Uh, my husband has written STEAM curriculum, started STEAM programs at schools, um, and he ran a maker space in El Dorado for kids for many years. Their tagline was learn, create, and innovate. So I'm really excited that you guys have added the play in because we know how important that is. Um, I hope that um, you know next year we can be in person again. I brought my kids to the big event that we had in 2020. And it was so magical and so, so cool. 
So I think it's wonderful that you all have put this together um, to be kind of a, a digital online version this year for everyone to participate in. And I look forward to being in person again soon. Thank you all again so much. Thank you very much. And now our superintendent, Superintendent Chavez. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, great to be here. And uh, I wanna welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. You know, first and foremost, for those that participated, you know, that's great. Um, that's something that we want to continue to promote and encourage, um, you know, special thanks to Angie Walker. I know this was a big uh, STEAM project for you and uh, putting this on for our families and for our students and also for our staff. We wanted to really acknowledge you as well. So again, st students, families, teachers, staff, uh, community members, welcome. We're, we're very pleased that you are here with us tonight to really welcome um, this expo into a format, a virtual for format. And as Secretary Bose mentioned, hopefully in the very new, near future, we become in-person once again. So tonight does mark the third year of our Innovation Expo, and I love that word, where we highlight the talents of our students and the dedication of our community members who bring STEAM fields to life in Santa Fe. We know that student success relies on skills such as problem solving, computational thinking, innovative thinking, um, the term that uses uh, that gets used often, thinking outside the box, um, and developing these type of skills that you can take with you throughout the rest of not only your educational career, but through life and your professional career. And as a district, uh, we are dedicated to excellence and innovation as we bring these skills to students in classrooms across the district. I would like to congratulate all students for their participation and engagement with STEAM learning. It is a, a very important part of Santa Fe Public Schools that we want to continue to promote and develop as we move forward. Now, it is my distinct honor to congratulate the first place winners that are on your screen, or what they were on your screen, of the district's STEAM Fair and their prizes. Would you like to share the screen? There we go. These are our participating schools. First place winners uh, and their grade and their sites. They are Andrew Plain from Asequia Madre, fourth, third grade, fourth grade, Bonnie Bannerman, El Dorado Community School. We'll give a silent clap for each one. Fifth grade, Alicia Wald, Wood Gormley Elementary School. Sixth grade, Aisha Dak. Dackley, I hope I pronounced that, and if not, I for, please forgive me, Carlos Gilbert Elementary. Seventh grade, Caitlin Rusher, El Dorado Community School. Eighth grade, Sawyer McIntosh, El Dorado Community School. And 10th grade, Henry, Henry Tixler, Ac uh, Academy for Technology and the Classics. And I think uh, El Dorado is well represented and, and also by our secretary of the board. These are our second place winners. Again, third grade, Kaylee Guthrie, Asequia Madre. Fourth grade, Elliot Hesh, Asequia Madre. Fifth grade, James McDonald, James McDonald and Leo Guerrera, Carlos Gilbert Elementary. Sixth grade, Leandro Narva Navarez and Nico Johnson, El Dorado Community. Seventh grade, Amelia Smith and Olivia Lilly, El Dorado Community School. Eighth grade, Landon Kessler, El Dorado Community School. I keep seeing Angie clap, so it's reminding me to clap. Tenth grade, Catherine Shula. I hope I pronounced that correctly, ATC. And those are our second place winners. And also, all of these winners will be. Um, listed on our website uh, for more details about their projects. Um, and again, here is our third place winners. Third grade, Alani Montoya, Cindy Tarasas, and Lawrence Bencomo, Nina Otero Community School. Fourth grade, Mateo Margolis, 
Carlos Gilbert Elementary. Fifth grade, Sophia Martinez, Wood Gormley. Sixth grade, Haley Penner. Mari Kofud, Loya. Marisol Maestas, tied with Isabel Taylor Alt from EJ Martinez and Ezequiel Madre. Seventh grade, Tobias Fa, El Dorado Community School. Eighth grade, Derek Darby, El Dorado Community School. And 10th grade, Leo Gessler, ATC. Congratulations on a job well done, STEAM Fair participants. And we really appreciate everyone um, really submitting their, their project for judging. You know, it's a, it's a great uh, accomplishment just to submit something um, on behalf of not only yourself, but your school. So job well done. We appreciate you and congratulations. Thank you very much, Superintendent Chavez. And now with the, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Neil Weaver, our Chief Information and Strategy Officer. Neil? Good evening, everyone. I want to uh, let you know, my name is Neil Weaver. I'm the Chief Information and Strategy Officer for Santa Fe Public Schools. Uh, and the first thing I'm, I'm going to do is, is echo what Board Secretary Bose and Superintendent Chavez said, and that is that I can't wait till we get back to a live version of this. We started this three years ago, and it was an incredible event. We had over 400 people who attended and sponsored and took part, uh, and it was such an engaging, enriching event to see our students uh, interacting with the community, showing off the great work that they've done. Um, I want to say welcome to everyone, and I'd also like to thank our community for your ongoing support of the Education Technology Note. The EdTech Note has been and continues to be a critical tool in ensuring that we have the systems, devices, and digital resources in place to support high-quality teaching and learning. ETN helped Santa Fe Public Schools to quickly pivot to remote learning when we were forced to close our schools as a result of COVID. And most important, your continued support of Santa Fe Public Schools will ensure that we are able to pursue best practice teaching and learning, whether we're in person, remote, or hybrid. Thank you, Santa Fe, and enjoy the expo tonight. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. And now it's my opportunity, my pleasure to introduce our guests for tonight. Our panelist guests um, include Jerome Morrison, Becca Sharp, and Chris Armijo. These three individuals come, with a, come to us with wide ranging interests and experiences in st STEAM fields. So Jerome, why don't you lead us off? Why don't you tell us about yourself, your experiences, and, and just share with us. Yeah, um, well, I really appreciate being able to be here with you all today. I'm very excited to, to just get the chance to start uh, working with schools, working with students again, because it actually has been a couple of years, as I'll get into in this presentation, that I'm going to work on making very brief. Um, so I'm a design technologist at Meow Wolf. And well, what exactly does a design technologist do? Well, what I get to do for Meow Wolf is I have uh, was hired on to work on projects like Omega Mart and Denver and Convergence Station where I get to uh, design some of the, the, a bunch of the different hardware and light, some of the, the, the lighting and sound integrations that happen inside of the space, all of those moments of joy, I get to work on the bits of technology that, that make that work. Um, and so here's a little bit of some of that work from Convergence Station also, where we've got some robots and, and uh, like crazy election machines. This place that's called Convergence Station, that's up in Denver, if you haven't had the chance to check it out yet. Um, I'm sure many of you all are definitely familiar with the one here in Santa Fe that I was hired on afterwards, uh, after that was built, and have been able to work with them on some of these future installations. And so one of the biggest things that I get to, that I got to do within these first couple of years was work on what we call our RFID system. I got to design, prototype, iterate, and build on not only the, the shell elements of like the touch screen and the speaker and the Raspberry Pi that's attached to that. And I'm gonna get into all of that in just a second. But also I got to work on a lot of the programming, the messages that need to go back and forth throughout the entire building that make all the lights and sounds and all of those moments of joy happen. 
So how is it that I actually got here, though? How did I get to become a design technologist here in Santa Fe and Meow Wolf uh, all, of, all these years later? Well, I got my, my undergraduate degree from the University of Florida, where I was in film and telecommunication production. And But the biggest thing that I learned from that, uh, from my time there in undergrad, was how a lot of creative things that I can do in a computer with just like the, the Photoshop, with the, uh, the Adobe suite, from Photoshop to Premiere Pro, being able to edit films, and being able to also do animation animations and whatnot. Well, I was able to take those skills, those animation, those film and storytelling skills, and then I got to attend a new media studio program at East Tennessee State University. And at the time, that's when the Microsoft Connect had just come out, just come out onto the market. And I was trying to figure out like how to make that device a little bit more interesting. I was seeing some of the games that were along with the Xbox that were supposed to work with this device. And I knew that there was something more interesting to have that could happen with that. And little did I know that there was now, you know, this entire entire new um, new media kind of explosion that was going to be happening around uh, that back in 2013, 2014. And all these different people that when I moved down to Austin, Texas, were also involved in uh, creating these and manipulating technology to, to, for some really fun means. And so this is one project that I got to do. It's called Hi-Fi, the Hi-Fi God. Uh, and it's a pseudo holographic, um, like interactive installation. And it was my first large scale kind of narrative thing that I got to make. And so while I was living in Austin, I got to make a bunch more of these things. I got to be involved with things like the Austin holidays, you know, stroll and sing along. And I got to, you know, make little tiny installations that made wonderful smiles like this child's face. Um, and I also got to build really big versions of that as well, too, with like, if you notice kind of the small prototype version that's here, and then iterate, designing, building in order to make those same kinds of projects, but now large scale where I can put somebody inside of it and they're able to manipulate the visuals that they're seeing because there's a Microsoft Connect that's down there. Skills that I had gained from, from graduate school and from undergrad. But the real meat and potatoes of what I'm excited to talk to y'all also about uh, is my time that I was able to be a teacher at Skybridge Academy for about three years. I was a media and technology teacher at this small private school just right now in Dripping Springs, Texas. And I got to design a whole bunch of different media and technology classes from 3D printing where we used uh, software like like AutoCAD, uh, Tinkercad, which is, you know, you can Google this right now and you can figure out how to do 3D models um, just right there on your computer. And then we took those 3D models and then made, uh, did 3D printing off of it. We also got to play some different kinds of Minecraft. There is an educational edition where you can even learn how to, how to do programming inside of the world of Minecraft. And there's a bunch of other tons of activities that I definitely encourage you all to take a look at to see where, you know, again, some of these ways you can gain the tech skills. I was also teaching 2D games design classes while I was there and that's really another uh, was one of my most popular classes because of course like kids love games and there are some very easy ways and game makers that make those these kinds of uh things very accessible for for younger ages and getting those basic ideas around logic and variables and mathematics skills, but able to have some really fun uh, outputs for those. Also, I very much encourage you to look into things like Raspberry Pis and Makey Makeys and Arduinos and all these things that have the lights and buttons and input output all, you know, th this very highly connected world that we're, that we're coming into now with all these IoT devices and all that stuff is pretty accessible for you to be able to learn from, you know, all the way down from the scratch level where you're just able to put these blocks together. Um, to even more complex types of programming that can happen. Another application that's really interesting is called MIT App Inventor. I did, did, got to do a little bit of playing around with this with some of my students as well. Um, and this does only work on Android only, but another thing, another free tool that is out there for you to start to learn a bit about programming. Also, while I was in Austin, like one of the biggest things that I got to do was also be a part of what's called the Austin Tinkering School. Um, and if you're not familiar with tinkering schools, I also implore you to go take a look at this TED Talk uh, by Gever Tully. He is the founder of what is called the, of, of the tinkering school mentality. And that is uh, about teaching kids how to work with wood, how to use power tools, how to design and iterate, and sometimes, you know, fail as well, like how to build, build something that maybe the structure isn't quite right. And then it, they sit on the chair and then the entire thing falls apart. But then how do you like learn from that process? How do you iterate? How do you grow? And all of this is just filled with so much play as well. So I implore you to take a look at that. And so it was also through the Tinkering School that we, there was an art collective that was started very much based around the ideas around um, Meow Wolf. And so here's one thing that we made called The Passage, another large scale installation that was called The Psychodome. Um, and just through, the, through those that work, through that collaboration, we actually did attract the attention of Meow Wolf where that was 
my kind of initial connection with the company and with, you know, in the early days when they had just opened up the House of Eternal Return. And then several years later, I wind up being hired back to work on things like RFID PCB design, where I'm iterating 3D printing and uh, figuring out how the programming on Raspberry Pis works. All of those skills that I've gained from the New Media Studio and skills that I gained from learning the things that I need to learn in order to teach other students how to do them or all of the things that I've been applying to make our future exhibitions connected and the lights, the sounds, those bits of delight um, all, all come back, come back around from that. So, you know, I'm very excited for this next generation that I'm, I'm having the privilege of being able to speak to you today because you all are definitely on the precipice of something really fantastic, uh, or at least it can be, you are the deciders. You will be some of the deciders who are, who are, who are changing the ways that these, that the technology is going to be used and adopted. And it's very important, I think, for our kids for this generation to understand what that technology is doing because as we see there are some some ways that that technology can be manipulated and so the the more native that we're able to help some of these upcoming students know and media literacy that they're able to gain in these tools they're going to be really prepared for the world and one last thing i want to leave you with this is my very last slide of the the motivation that i loved that i have when it comes to a lot of this tech work that i get to do has to do with like what's called self-determination theory because it's a space where you are able to have both autonomy, relatedness, and competence. And these three things together create volition. So when you're working within tech fields, like you are able to immediately get your competency tested. When you try and compile code, it gives you immediately an error that of like what it is that you've done wrong. Or you're able to take that error and then throw it into Google and have some other tutorial that tells you how to get through that. With the autonomy, like the entire world is yours. The first line of code that you ever get to write, a lot of times is usually hello world. You've got this entire library of the possibilities abilities are endless and those realms and those people that you get involved with and these types of codes and programs are going to build wonderful relationships that you will be working off of the libraries and off of the work of people who have come before you and laying more foundation of things to come you'll be able to see where you where you started you know with your programming journey with your tech journey years ago how it is that you're how you're improving now what is that relationship over time these three things they are all mixed up in, in the work that I have the privilege of being able to do. And I want and hope for everybody else to have more access to these kinds of tools, because especially when they're free and online, if you just have access to a computer. Um, and that's kind of me in a quick nutshell, especially like around the tech side and, and uh, working with students. So you all can find here some websites you can find uh, me at, or also drop me a line in my email. And I uh, super appreciate y'all. Thank you. Wow, Jerome, thank you so much for sharing all about your journey and your in-depth work. It's, uh, it's absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much. So let's go to Becca next. Becca, why don't you tell us about your experience and what brought you here today? Thank you very much. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Thank you for having me here today. Um, my name is Becca Sharp, and like a lot of you, I am a student as well. And so um, I am also a media tech artist. And so really I love to learn and build things using recycled materials and compost and then creating a um, really magical world with technology involved in that. And so, uh, like I said, I'm a student like most of you. This is my beautiful building that I get to work at. This is at the Media Arts and Technology at New Mexico Highland University in Las Vegas. I'm so thankful to be able to create in this building and use really great technology that, um, that I've used to create some of these projects that you're gonna see. Uh, one of the first projects that I created in this beautiful building was called Pixel Kingdom. And this was made from completely recycled cardboard from the Las Vegas area. And it was used, um, we used our laser cutter as well as our 3D printer at the school to create different, uh, different uh, trees. This tree was 10 foot tall and we also created clouds and different interactions. So you would take this light and walk around and you would shine it on different sensors that then would open a door and a smell would come out or you would shine it and then the clouds would turn on. And so it was a really fun um, exploration for people to have. And this was a project dedicated to our friend, um, David Howard. And so next up um, through my school, I've also been able to intern in wonderful places, one being Meow Wolf. And I think Jerome, I was there just like, like right before you got there. So I think we just missed each other. But um, so I went and I was able to work on different things like 
the uh, mech, which is a giant robot that's in Denver. And I was also able to really learn like what I wanted to do and what I love to do. And that was working with cable management, that was soldering and really doing installation design. And that was when I decided I want to be an installation artist and I want to build for museums. But I also getting my MFA, I have a heart for teaching. And so I want to teach and also create um, help others create wonderful installations. And so um, this led me to one of my first projects or uh, for a, um, a historic site and this was for the Hemis historic site. And this was a game where users could place their own luminarias around the Hemis site. And so we used a drone and we got a 3D scan of the actual trails, put them in a 3D modeling website, cleaned it up a little bit or software, excuse me, and then put it into a video game software and then created this experience for users to have. This is on like touch screen over at the Hemis historic site. But when we were in COVID, we actually went ahead and me and one of my mentors uh, took this game and we made it available online so that users could play at home while we were here. And so um, another project I'd love to share with you um, is called Frigid Fight. And this was a project that I worked on for my BFA. And so this was a really big project and I made it completely at my building and everything in this project was made from recycled materials. And the only thing that I bought was hot glue and duct tape. And so my wonderful friends would let me fill their cars with gross old milk jugs that were stinky. And then I would take them to the building and I'd spend hours cleaning these milk jugs and then gluing them together with hot glue. And so I wanted to create a um, experience for users that really focused on our plastic use and how this is affecting, um, actually how this affects penguins and glacier change. And so uh, what I did here was I created a glacier made out of four walls and it had over 400 milk jugs that were in there glued together. And I actually got um, old tech and old uh, e-waste from Meow Wolf. And so I used their old stuff that they were done using and that was in the trash. I took it out and I soldered it all back together and cleaned it up. And so I used that for the lights. And then I used our laser cutter at our building and I created four different animatronic penguins. And each penguin had a different action. So one of them would waddle, one of them would flap its wings. Uh, one of them would uh, do a penguin call at you when you walked near it. And the other one would illuminate as you came near it. And so I also created a video game. And so this wasn't the necessarily like the happiest video game, but it was for learning. And so you would play as a penguin and you were searching for food. And this was to talk about overfishing and how overfishing is creating penguins having to swim out further, but some of them are dying because they can't reach the food fast enough. So most of the time you would never win this game and you would be told that like, I'm sorry, you weren't able to find food and so you have died. And then it would give you uh, information and informative fact from um, that I had received from National Geographic or other um, reliable sources. And so the last thing I created was a deck of cards. And this was a deck of cards that you can play and also learn about penguin facts and about climate change as well. And so this had information in those as well. And the last, um, last thing I want to say is I made a four and a half foot penguin. Her name is Patricia. And I still have her today. She's in my home. And so she is a great um, addition to this project. The next thing I wanted to really do as I started my MFA was I wanted to explore using compost and recycled materials more, but also in a different format. And so I wanted to learn paper. And so a wonderful artist in Santa Fe taught me how, or I'm sorry, in um, Albuquerque, uh, she taught me how to make paper and I wanted to make it completely from compostable or recycled material. So I didn't want to use any chemicals. So typically a paper has a chemical in it that allows you to write on the paper. And so, and so the ink doesn't um, turn it back into paper basically, but I wanted to use things that were all grown in New Mexico. And so I used things that um, this artist had grown in her garden, like eggplants and just compost from like leeks and onions and rhubarb. And so these different, uh, these different vegetables had binding materials. So they would create this paper. And after I used the paper, then I would use it and I would, or after the paper dried and I had these pieces of paper, I laser cut and I would use laser cut to create different cards and different 
things for um, for this project. And because the paper had no chemicals, when you're done with the vegetable paper, you could put it back into the ground. You can put it into your compost. When you're done with the recycled paper, it can be it was turned back into paper and um, just turned back into that paper pulp. And so this was a completely recycled project as well. And so this was something that um, I did right before. Um, right before we actually went into COVID, which brings me to the final project I did. And this was one that I had to do from, I started not at home and then ended up building it at home. So it was a little bit of a different challenge. And so this was for an internship uh, uh, through my department and they're always nice and paid internships. We always do paid internships. And so this was at the New Mexico Museum of Art. And this was for an installation called Breathtaking. And what, um, what the museum really wanted was they wanted some lights behind that would illuminate and kind of like breathe with it. And so what I did was I had to do a lot of work at home, drumming out, uh, drumming this thick acrylic letter to put in LEDs. And um, I love LEDs and working with lights, anything that lights up. You know, um, one of my professors, they were like moths and we just love lights and it's so true. And so I love lights. And so um, really just working with these LEDs and creating this building that would uh, invite users into this space. And with my mentors, we created our own circuit and were able to fabricate everything. And this was an exhibit that was up and just went down in September, I believe. And with that, I just want to thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here and I have some information there. And um, if you ever also want to see me, you can come up to New Mexico Highlands University at the Media Arts Department and I'll show you around our building and our cool stuff. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Wow, Becca, thank you so much sharing all of your work around your installations and your work around recycling and your innovation overall. Just thank you. What a great, uh, thank you for sharing. All right, and our last um, panelist, <clears throat> excuse me, our last panelist is Chris Armijo. Chris, why don't you introduce yourself and share, share your work with us? Okay, I'd love to. All right, let me just get things set up here. All right, so I'm Chris Armijo, and um, I'd like to start off by saying that I'm not a technologist or a scientist or an artist or a mathematician. I am an educator, and I'm an educator with a passion for creating the kind of learning environments where budding young scientists, technologists, engineers, artists, and people like Jerome and Becca really can tap into their own passions uh, where all students can do that and, um, and kind of get that spark lit. Um, I really believe that when we encourage students to innovate and play, the learning is magnified a hundredfold and the outcomes may exceed our wildest imaginations. I think you saw examples of that from the last two panelists for sure. And um, it, all of this really, I think, has an opportunity to start in the classroom. I know this because it was my own experience as a student and I can trace my journey into play and innovate, innovation to one very pivotal moment way back in eighth grade. So um, let me introduce you to eighth grade me, aside from being very fashion forward, obviously not. I was a very curious and creative kid. I enjoyed figuring things out and I was always up for a challenge. I was a storyteller and a poet and I loved solving problems and helping people. One day a teacher handed me a video camera and said, go do your thing. That was my first introduction to technology, and I truly, it truly changed the course of my life. Um, at that point, I had never held anything quite so expensive, um, and that being that this was in the mid-1980s, I had also never held anything quite so heavy. I mean, look at the size of that thing, right? And now we have camera in our pocket, thank goodness. Um, so anyway, I asked my teacher, well, what is my thing? And she said, why don't you go and find out? 
So I did. That camera followed me or allowed me to tell stories in a whole new way. Then one thing led to another, and it wasn't long before I became quite a tinkerer with all kinds of technology, um, using it for all kinds of things, um, including solving problems and helping people. I was always asking, what would happen if I did this? Or I wonder if I could do that. And I would hear that teacher's voice saying, why don't you go and find out? Um, so as a young adult, I ended up doing all kinds of cool things with multimedia. I, I'll have to admit the things I did weren't half as cool as some of the things you just saw, but I, I was a co-creator of one of the very first travel websites ever to grace the World Wide Web. This was a long time ago. Um, but ultimately something in my heart drew me to the classroom. So I became a teacher and it, it, of course I took that passion with me and, and a desire to really um, encourage my students to go out and find their thing the way I had been empowered to do. So in my classroom, um, students used computers and cameras and various other gadgets to create amazing things and to tell their stories and to solve problems. Um, but eventually I did move into my, my position now as ed tech coordinator for the Moriarty Edgewood School District. And I have the privilege of supporting other educators with integrating classroom technologies um, to transform learning outcomes. And in recent years, I've really focused on helping teachers shift to more student-centered learning models and to foster student agency. But the truth is that is still very difficult for many teachers to make the kind of shifts um, instructionally away from more traditional models. So to me, this became a challenge worth seeking a solution to address. And that ended up taking me on a whole new adventure. In 2019, I applied to and became the first New Mexico educator accepted into the Google for Education Certified Innovator Program. And with that, I started on what was meant to be a year long journey to create a solution for this challenge that I had identified. Um, once I was accepted into the program, we dove right in, all, all the members of the cohort dove right in to, um, to research on, on our individual prod projects. And then we got to travel to the UK to spend three days working in Google buildings in London with a group of top educators from around the world um, at the Google Innovation Academy. And at that academy, it was framed by a series of sparks and sprints. So sparks were sessions designed to build capacity, influence development of new ideas, and otherwise spark new thoughts and ideas. And the sprints were rigorous and flexible um, like design periods that were really geared for the innovators to push our projects forward. And all of it um, combined elements of Google's innovation lab and design sprint curriculums and Google's product design model and their design thinking um, for educators program to provide the foundation for guiding innovators through early prototypes and iterations of our projects. Uh, let me tell you, this work was intense. It was my very first exposure to the design thinking process, and it was amazing. Of course, I had created things before and tweaked and improved upon them as I went, but I had never actually followed a protocol like this before. So the first step of the process, we began by taking that pre-academy research that we did, and we used it to kind of take a deep dive into identifying user needs and really um, further defining what our challenge was all about. And from there, we started to ideate potential projects and sketch out potential solutions, seek feedback, and then quickly iterate to improve it. And Next, we began the process of actually prototyping our project, um, building a minimum viable product that would address the needs that we identified in our research. And then we did rounds of quick prototyping, testing each other's prototypes and providing critical feedback. 
Finally, we pitched our projects to the group and a global audience via live stream on the last day. That was nerve wracking, but fun. <laughs> and then when, um, after the Academy, we returned to our homes to work with our mentors over the next year to finalize our products and prepare them for launch. Unfortunately, the development of my project called Shift Keys came to a halt in March of 2020 when the pandemic hit. And while I'm not able to resume development just yet, I still came away from this innovator experience with an even stronger passion for empowering our students with experiences like this. The design thinking process is a powerful cycle used in industries globally to bring about innovation. So taking design thinking into K-12 classrooms gives students early exposure to practices commonly used in STEM fields and equips them to develop creative solutions to the wicked problems they care about right now. This isn't all just about preparing them for the future. It's, it's preparing them to do great things right where they're at. And so with that, you know, it, it, you just never know where doing their thing will take a kid. And, um, and so, yeah, so I um, just wanna close with a reminder to teachers to hand over the tools, give them the camera, only now give them a drone or, or a laser cutter or something, but carefully, um, and tell them to do their thing. And for students listening, if you don't know what your thing is, go out and find it. Definitely go out and find it. There's lots of adventures to be had. Um, and also, I'd also like to invite teachers to reach out to me if you have questions or would like um, resources about the innovator program or ways to get design thinking and innovation into your classrooms. Wow, Chris, thank you so much for sharing uh, your technology storytelling, your design thinking. Fantastic. In fact, all three panelists, thank you for sharing your breadth of experiences and innovation. And oh my gosh, it was everywhere. And wonderful. Thank you. So we have some time for a couple of questions. So we're going to kind of do it free flow panelists. I'm going to throw out some questions and whoever wants to jump in, we can do that. So, um, and I know Chris, you touched on this, but so uh, Jerome and Becca, is there a pivotal moment or an event somewhere in your life or career, something that really directed you on your current path? Is it the one thing that, that kind of tipped you in that direction? Uh, it feels a little cliche to say, but I got the chance to, in 2016, I also go out to Burning Man and like take an entire big project out to the middle of the desert with a big collaborative group of people all throughout Austin. And just of being like a part of that team and then many of the problems that we very much ran into like during this two, like two, like week, two and a half week journey, just trying to get out there and then the week trying to get back taught me that I'm capable of doing some really big things. And I think it's like being able to take on a big task and then like have the success of that, especially when it's collaborative and then just being it like in that task, in that moment, very taxing and just like draining, but then being able to look back on it and say like, oh, wow, like we did that. Um, definitely has been a boon in, in terms of like what I know I am capable of. Thanks, Jerome. Becca? Yes, thanks, Dan. I'd say for me, um, it was uh, probably my sophomore year of my undergrad here at uh, New Mexico Highlands University, the media arts, and there was this class called Picked, and it's actually one that um, I did show where I did the Hemis project, but this was for the Bradbury Science Museum in Los Alamos. And this is an upper level class and it's a, a, it's a grad level class at times. And so um, it's just really, uh, it's a lot of work and it's installation design and it's working with a team of students and it's one semester long and it's completely changing a museum and bringing brand new technology. And I didn't think I could do it. Um, one of my professors was like, I want you to try this. And I was like, nope, I can't do it. I just, I can't do it, that's scary that um, I, I don't know how I'm only like, this is only my third semester. Like I was like, I can't keep up with the upper level classmen. And, but they encouraged me and they were like, please try it, please try it. Like you can do this. And so I did it. I was able to do an installation. It's a permanent installation at the Bradbury Science Museum. And I was able to see some amazing things. And I learned that if I can take that step forward and like push myself and like, it's really scary sometimes. But 
when I said yes to things, then more things came and I could keep saying yes to more and more things. And so that was kind of my pivotal moment, I would say. Wow, what a great story of grit. Go ahead, I'm sorry, Jerome, go ahead. Absolutely can echo that of like saying yes to those things and to those challenges. And then just that like having the cop, the challenge proving your competency is, is always very rewarding, so yeah. Thank you, so the next question is for all three of you. So our theme this year is innovate, learn and play. How is your current work reflecting one or all three of those themes? Well, um, I can go first, uh, Dan. So I'd say pretty much always I'm trying to think about how to how to make something fun because and how to play because I think we do a lot of work. And so I think it's good to find also the fun and the enjoyment in the things we do. And so I think a lot of my work does revolve around play. It's around touching things and exploration and hearing things and um, using sight, smell, um, just all of your senses. And so I think also in doing that um, through installation art and through different things, we really can uh, teach each other and, and on things that are also like climate change and things about right now, I'm working on things about mental health and technology. And so really everything is about um, really how we can educate each other to, I think in my opinion, to understand each other better and understand the world around us better. And so that's where I think my work with Innovate, Learn and Play is kind of in there. Thanks, Becca. Chris or Jerome? I can go next on this one. Thank you, Dan. Um, so uh, my job right now has been a little bit different than it normally is because of COVID and, um, and not having necessarily all the same kind of access to the educators and, and definitely to the students that I normally get to have in my environment <laughs> um, physically. Uh, so we've definitely had to innovate ways to support teachers through all of this and, and that kind of thing. But, um, but it, what, one thing I'm really excited about is we have been um, working with um, trying to incorporate more play into the classroom and really kind of getting into that science of purposeful play and how how specifically learning can happen through that where um, we did some work over the past summer with um, John Meehan and Michael Matera who wrote Fully Engaged um, which is about student engagement and using play and learning and all the science behind how that that really does work and and um, so so excited uh, now that things are kind of opening up. I mean, I'll be getting in back into classrooms after spring break and, and very excited to put some of those, those things into practice in classrooms. Uh, Thanks, Chris. And, and, ahead, and yeah, yeah to, just to round it out, like play definitely is a major part of the work that, that I do, especially when it comes to like even going all the way back to grad school of you can't really innovate until you're able to really get it in front of somebody else who thinks differently from you, who has some different kinds of biases and sees the ways that they're going to interact and play with the thing that you have made. There may be a different interpretation that they have of the thing that you've made. And instead of being, you know, locked down on like, oh man, it was supposed to be this finite thing and it's not, it's not fitting inside this box that I wanted it to be, realizing the potential of how you can make things that other people can play with and other folks can figure out like the, the ways that they may be inspired with it and then take that information, take that feedback and then put it back in to, to be able to innovate. We have to do a, a lot of that with when it comes to like things like user testing, you know, things that we will design at Meow Wolf. We don't, we, we have, as a designer, as the person who's making it, I have a certain way that I think people are going to interact with the thing, but until, but you, you were, I am constantly surprised by how somebody will reinterpret something that was like was meant to be designed exactly this way. And so there's a sort of freedom that is um, allowing that to just sort of happen and like and seeing how people may interact with the thing that you've made, taking in that information, taking that feedback and innovating with it and just being in that um, that cycle. Yeah. Great, thank you. And so we are so close on time, but I think one last question is so important. So panelists, I'll need a quick sentence from you. What advice or words of inspiration do you have for our students? You are architects of the possible. 
Keep Googling, you'll probably find the answer on GitHub or Stack Overflow or YouTube or somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to say keep creating even if no one's going to see it. Just keep creating even if it's just for even if it's just for yourself. Wow, fantastic. Truly, we could go on till 10, 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Thank you so very much for some great ideas of inspiration, your story, your ideas. I hope that we all take away some great ideas from you. So thank you, panelists. Uh, we are going to go ahead and switch over. We're running a little bit late, but we got this. Um, thank you for joining our panel discussion. And we're going to turn it over to our superintendent, who's going to share the names of our 10 Meow Wolf Raffle Prize winners. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. Thank you, Meow Wolf. And also, uh, you know, I want to say thank you to Jerome as well, since he is representing Meow Wolf. Uh, we have 10. Um, Meow Wolf raffle tickets to give away um, to our participants today. So students, teachers, and DLCs, each prize contains one free ticket to Meow Wolf, a mug, a notebook, and stickers. So again, we want to say thank you to our partner in this as we uh, announce the winners. As you can see on the screen, it is Cash Keys, Canyon Danger, and Taurus Nelson, Richard Gonzalez, Laura Zurlnik, Luis Garcia, Gabriel Marcus Chavez, Ricardo Mejia, Kaylee Pacheco, um, Nathaniel Hernandez Ordonez, and then we have Brian Alejandro Luna Lopez. So we want to congratulate our 10 winners of the Mal Wolf Raffle Pl Prizes. And with that being said, just a round of applause. To enter into uh, the raffle for additional prizes, okay, these are additional prizes, including the grand prize of an iPad mini. Please fill out the form that is located in the chat. So again, we will provide that link in the chat, and that's where you add additional um, chances for you to win prizes and also that grand prize of an iPad mini. So again, we want to thank everyone who participated and again, Mal Wolf for being our partner in this. Thank you, Superintendent Chavez. And so we're going to go ahead and go to our session one breakout sessions. Uh, please go to the Expo website and that's where you can go to access all the sessions. Don't forget to sign up for our raffle of our free iPad mini and other prizes. The link is also an opportunity, opportunity for you to share your thoughts and give us feedback in planning for next year's expo. So we're gonna go, we have a break scheduled at 5.50 to 5.55, and then you're gonna jump into your second session. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, just submit it in the chat. Thank you.
Hello and welcome. If you have wound up back here in our general session, uh, between session one and session two, well, go ahead and start making a selection for your next breakout session. Uh, don't forget, this is also an opportunity for you to go up and sign up for our raffle, uh, the big raffle prize of a free iPad mini or other raffle prizes that we have. The link, the, uh, the link also gives you an opportunity to share your thoughts and give us feedback in planning for next year's expo. So thanks for showing up and please sign in to session two. We'll be getting back together at 625. Thank you.
Welcome back. Thank you for participating in our two different sessions, our panelist discussions. We appreciate your time being here this evening. In closing, we appreciate all the work that has gone into the event. Tonight has truly been a collaborative effort between to the technology department, teaching and learning, our community engagement folks, community, our community, and of course, all the work at the school sites by our incredible students, teachers, administrators, and digital learning coaches. In addition to our collaboration with district departments, schools, and community, our event was also a part of our work as a board resolution focused on being computer science ready 2025. The event tonight makes it clear why SFPS is a destination for excellence in teaching and learning. A special thank you to Michael Gourlay for his in-depth tech support and expertise. Our community organizations for your support and helping our helping STEAM live within our and beyond our schools. And don't forget the raffle Google form will be kept open till 7 p.m. We will then put all the raffle prizes and um, which will include our grand prize of our iPad mini. Those winners will be notified uh, tomorrow. Thank you again. And for our final closing remarks, our superintendent. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I just wanna say congratulations. I was able to pop into five different rooms. Um, I was able to, to watch Ms. Gonzalez actually go through one of the projects and she did an amazing, an amazing job. So I was very impressed. Uh, I saw third graders presenting their screen and walking us through the project, which showed these 21st century skills. I was able to see different uh, ideas around food and math and you know, flipping a, a penny. I remember when I was sharing that experience, one of the, the items that I was able to, to uh, observe was a project I used to do with my, my two kids. I have a son and a daughter and we we're flipping the penny 20 times and then we would uh, calculate how many times it would land on heads or tails. So it was wonderful. I wanna thank everyone who came out tonight to participate, not only the staff, the students, but I also saw parents in the, in the breakout room. So I wanna thank the parents for coming out. And again, the Santa Fe Public School team for putting this on, you know, I, I appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. And for those classrooms that I was not able to enter, if you wanna send me an invite, I would love to come visit you and you can take me through your project. So again, I have that open invitation out there to everyone else, but again, thank you. Have a great night. And, and I appreciate all the participation that we had this evening. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Good night, everyone.